This video will cover the higher level content from C3.2 on defense against disease. The higher level section of this topic centers around this concept of immunity. And when we think about immunity, we want to think of our adaptive immune system. And that adaptive immune system is all centered around the ability to produce antibodies. Okay, so let's do a quick review of how we get antibodies. First, a pathogen is going to be engulfed by a phagocyte, and the antigen is going to be presented on the outside of that phagocyte. Antigen presentation activates T cells, and these T cells in turn find and activate the correct B cell that is capable of producing an antibody specific to that pathogen. These B cells are going to clone themselves via mitosis many times, and then we'll start to differentiate. Some of these plasma or some of these B cells differentiate into plasma cells, and these plasma cells are the cells that produce the antibodies. However, some of these B cells end up differentiating into memory cells, and memory cells are different from antibodies in the fact that they remain in the blood. Antibodies are in general going to decrease in their concentration when that pathogen has been eliminated from the body. Memory cells, however, remain in the blood for long periods of time, and their purpose is to produce a rapid response if the pathogen is ever detected again. So this whole process of engulfing and activating and cloning and differentiating and antibody production can take a while, and all that time you're sick, you're feeling symptoms, you might even die. Okay, memory cells are going to produce a much more vigorous and rapid response so that that pathogen is eliminated from the body before you even start to feel sick. And that is the basis of immunity. So immunity is high having either these antibodies from the plasma cells or memory cells to fight a pathogen, okay? And that is how we get this immunity. Of course, that immunity is based on being able to recognize that pathogen. And if you've already studied viruses, you know that the HIV viruses is just one of those viruses that mutates very quickly and tends to evade our immune system. So if you haven't studied it, that's okay. We're going to go through some different material now that's less about virus structure and more about transmission. So HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. And this virus is very good at hanging around in the body fluids of an infected person. So I should be thinking blood, um, vaginal secretion, semen, etc. Because it's in the body fluids, that's the way that it is transmitted from person to person. So infection relies on transmission between hosts. So there are a few ways that transmission can happen. Um, it could be unprotected sex with an infected person, the sharing of needles, so that's blood to blood, um, transfusion of blood from an infected person, and even during childbirth. So there is a risk to the child if a mother has HIV for contracting that virus. One of the reasons that HIV is so devastating isn't necessarily because of the initial symptoms, but more because it destroys our body's immune system and ability to fight off other pathogens. So when a person is first infected with HIV, that viral load goes up really quickly. Now our bodies are okay at fighting off that pathogen initially, and after a short period of time of feeling symptoms, that viral load can actually go back down and lay latent, almost like dormant, in a person for a long period of time. Eventually, however, this viral load will start to increase again. All the while, this virus is being very sneaky and it is destroying the T cells that our body has, okay? So this T cell count is going to go low, 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 low. So eventually we have so many HIV viruses in the bloodstream that they completely destroy all of the T cells. Well, what do T cells do? 
they activate B cells. So if you don't have T cells and you can't activate B cells, you cannot produce antibodies to any infection. Okay, and so at this point, when the, we've completely lost the ability to produce antibodies um, because our T cell count is so low, this person is no longer considered to just have the HIV virus. Okay, this person is considered to have this syndrome called AIDS. So this is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So immunodeficiency refers to the fact that the helper T cells have been destroyed. And at this point, it's not the HIV virus that kills people. No one dies of HIV and no one really dies of AIDS. What they die from is opportunistic infections like pneumonia that most people would be able to fight off with their um, immune system and their antibodies, but they've uh, lost the ability to make those antibodies. Now, current antiretroviral drugs, so current medicine uh, against this HIV virus, can actually stop and halt this immune system damage. In fact, these drugs are getting so good now that someone with HIV who's receiving the proper medical care can live a, a life that is just as long um, and just as healthy as someone without HIV. But it's about catching it early and preventing this total decimation of of our antibody producing capabilities. So far, we've talked about some similar sounding words, right? Antigens, recognition proteins on the outside of a cell or virus, antibodies, um, what's produced by our B cells, by our plasma cells um, that can attach to those antigens. And now we're gonna add a third one in, which is antibiotic. And antibiotics are not really related at all to antigens or antibodies. So even though they sound similar, we need to find a way of categorizing them in our brain brain. Antibiotics are chemicals that block processes occurring in bacteria, in prokaryotes. So antibodies are not chemicals, they're biological, they're proteins. Antibiotics are chemicals. And they're very cool because they disrupt prokaryotic metabolism. So that's the word I want to remember here, prokaryotic metabolism. So that means they can affect a bacteria's ability to make proteins or to replicate their DNA or to build their cell wall. They're doing something to disrupt that process. And the cool part about this for humans is that we can take these antibiotics um, because it doesn't affect human cells. Human cells don't need to build a cell wall and they have different metabolic pathways for protein synthesis and DNA replication. So because they are for prokaryotes, okay, that means that it doesn't affect human cells. Unfortunately, it means that they also don't affect viruses. And the reason for that is because viruses don't have their own metabolism. They rely on the host cell. So mm, good and bad stuff about antibiotics. Some organisms like fungi naturally produce um, antibiotics. So we can see that here. Here's a fungus and it's growing on a plate that has a lot of bacteria growing on it. You can see that there is no bacteria growing around this um, fungus. And that's because the fungus secretes natural antibiotics. And the goal of that is to eliminate competition for resources with nearby bacteria. This is actually how all of those early antibiotics were discovered and manufactured. We need to remember that with antibiotics, we should only be taking them for bacterial infections. Again, they do not work against viruses because viruses don't have a metabolism. Not only that, but we have to be very careful about developing antibiotic resistance. Now, resistance is caused by a mutation. Mutations occur within individuals and they are random. So whether or not a bacteria can develop a mutation for resistance is totally random. They can't do it just because they want to. Okay, now, when I'm not taking a, an antibiotic, there's no advantage to that gene for resistance. So if a bacteria has that resistance gene, it doesn't really matter until you start taking an antibiotic. 
antibiotics are going to kill the non-resistant bacteria. So all of these bacteria without that resistance gene are going to die. And what that does is it eliminates all the competition. So now all of a sudden, these resistant bacteria have a huge advantage. They're resistant to that antibiotic and we've eliminated all of their competition. And so that resistant strain becomes the dominant strain. And that means next time I have a bacterial infection and I take the antibiotic, it's not going to work because all of the bacteria are resistant to that antibiotic. What's also scary is that bacteria can do something that you and I cannot do, which is that they can do something called horizontal gene transfer. They can actually pass that gene for resistance onto uh, not only its offspring, but other species. So it can take that gene and give it to nearby bacteria of a totally different species. And then now that species is going to be resistant to the antibiotic. So this is something that we really need to keep an eye on here. We want to make sure that we're only taking antibiotics when absolutely necessary. That means you have a bacterial infection, not viral. That also might mean that we need to restrict the use of antibiotics for farm animals. Many farm animals are given antibiotics, um, not because they're sick, but because one of the side effects of antibiotics for domesticated livestock is that it helps them to grow. So they're given antibiotics to promote their growth, but that unintentionally results in lots of these resistant strains um, persisting in a population. And then we also have an obligation as a scientific community to continue to develop new types of antibiotics. In the not so distant future, all of the antibiotics that we have are likely to have some bacterial populations that are resistant to it. So we need to make sure that we're continuing to innovate and producing new antibiotics to which nothing has developed that resistance yet. Most pathogens we're going to find can only infect either one species or a group of closely related species. And that's because in order for something to infect a host, its antigens have to fit in with the receptors on the host cell. So unrelated species are unlikely to have receptors that fit with that antigen. So infection isn't possible. Okay, so these are mostly closely related or identical species that get infected by that same pathogen. There are exceptions, however, and those are called zoonoses. These are pathogens that can be transmitted um, from other species or between species. And we're specifically going to look at ones that can be transferred from other species to humans. And there are several examples that we want to be able to recall. One of which is tuberculosis, and this is a bacteria that is passed on um, between cows and people through unpasteurized infected milk. So if a cow has a tuberculosis infection, that bacteria can make its way into the milk. If the milk does not get pasteurized, that can then be passed to humans. Again, cow to human. Rabies is a virus that passes from dogs or other mammals to humans. It's usually through a scratch or a bite, again, from an infected animal. Japanese encephalitis is another virus. This one passes between either pigs or birds to humans through another animal vector, through mosquito bites. And then COVID-19, um, who knows, right? Um, lots of data still coming out on this. There is some evidence that suggests that the virus may have been passed from bats to humans. So again, the thought here is just understanding that most pathogens can only infect one species. Zoonoses are pathogens that can be transmitted between different species. Before we get into vaccines, let's talk a little bit about just how we produce antibodies to begin with, with our adaptive immune system. So when we're infected with a pathogen, it can sometimes take a lot of time to activate T cells and activate B cells and clone them and produce plasma cells. Okay, so it takes a lot of time to produce those antibodies. And during this primary infection, we're feeling sick. Okay, eventually, once we produce enough antibodies and destroy that pathogen, the antibody concentration will go back down. 
Now, if we have antibodies that remain, or even better, memory cells in our blood that remain after that infection, then the next time that we are um, exposed to that pathogen, we have a much more vigorous, that means more antibodies, and faster response to that pathogen. And we're able to fight that off before we even feel any symptoms. So this is really the basis of immunity here. What vaccines do is that they um, initiate an adaptive immune response, okay? So that's that primary, that first time immune response without the symptoms of infection. And this relies on antigens. So there are a couple of ways that this can happen, um, but basically you want to inject that antigen or make sure that that antigen is in the bloodstream. That way, the phagocytes can ingest it and present it and activate T cells and activate B cells and produce plasma cells and produce memory cells. But I don't want to inject the parts of the pathogen that are going to actually make you sick. So it's a way of kind of like tricking our body um, into having this first immune response without getting sick. Um, so that next time, if we ever come in contact with the real pathogen, we can have a very quick and vigorous immune response without ever feeling the symptoms. So again, this relies on putting that antigen into the bloodstream to initiate that adaptive immune response. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. You can either inject the antigen directly, and some traditional vaccines still work this way. They'll take this virus and they'll empty out the insides and just take this antigen coating and inject that into our body. Our body has an immune response and produces antibodies for this antigen, but there was nothing on the inside of the virus to make us sick. That's one way of doing it. The other and very clever way of doing this is to inject mRNA codes. So we know that mRNA is a chemical messenger that codes for proteins. So mRNA can be translated into proteins. And guess what? These antigens are proteins, that's what they are. So inside of this virus, there must be some kind of genetic code for how to make this protein. If we can isolate that genetic code, we don't actually have to inject the virus, we can just inject the mRNA into our cells. Our cells will take up that mRNA and they will translate it just like they would any other piece of RNA. So what's actually happening here is our cells have kind of been tricked into producing the antigens, just the proteins, and then our cells are producing those antigens that are going to initiate the immune response from the phagocytes and T cells and B cells. We have not injected any of the viral genetic material that would actually make us sick, just the part for how to make the antigens that elicit that immune response. Now, not everybody can handle vaccinations, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, maybe they are immunocompromised, maybe they are pregnant, maybe they're allergic to some of the vaccine components, but there will always be people in a population that are medically unable to be vaccinated. So it's very important for the rest of the population to become vaccinated um, or develop natural immunity in order to develop herd immunity. And herd immunity is is when enough of the population has developed immunity, vaccination or a natural infection, so that the pathogen pretty much disappears. So if we think about how pathogens work, they have to be able to go from host to host to host. That's how they are transmitted. If enough people are vaccinated or have some kind of immunity, then what we're doing is we are eliminating possible hosts for that pathogen and it can't be transmitted. What percent of the population needs to have immunity in order to be considered herd immunity depends on how infectious that pathogen is. If it is not very infectious, you can lower the percentage of the people that need immunity because of that virus or that bacteria is spreading very slowly anyways. The more infectious that pathogen is, the higher the percentage of people that must have some kind of immunity in order for herd immunity to be established and to eradicate that pathogen from the wider population.
The last part of this topic is about evaluating data from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, when we say evaluate data, that doesn't mean memorize data. We don't even have all of the data probably yet. What evaluate means is taking the data that is available and being able to look at it in multiple ways. So one of the things that we'll do is we can use this data to calculate percentage. So on the 11th of September, 2021, or by that date, in New Zealand, there were 3,510 cases of COVID, that's incidents, and 27 known deaths. What percent of the infections resulted in death? So to calculate percent, okay, I'm going to take the number that resulted in death, so that's 27, and I'm going to divide that by the total number of cases, 3,510. Now, because I want a percentage, once I find this in my calculator, once I do 27 divided by 3,510, I'm going to multiply that by 100 and I'm getting 0.86% or about that much okay so to calculate percent it's just one number divided by another number and once I find that I'm going to multiply it by 100 one of the more common things that we're going to have to calculate, not only in this topic, but just data questions in general, is percent change. So this is a formula I would definitely try to remember. You won't have this formula available to you. You're expected to know it. To calculate percent change, you're going to take the final minus the initial. Once you have found that, you're going to divide that by the initial value and then multiply by 100. So we'll give this a try. In Norway, in the week of 7th of February, 2022, there were 141,784 COVID-19 infections. Okay, so that is my initial value. So I'm just gonna circle that here. This is my initial value. All right. During the next week, February 14th, there were a total of 1,000 or 101,190 cases. Okay, so this is my final value. So this is my like after bit here, okay? What is the percent change? Well, so I need to take my final value. So I'm going to take 101,190 and I'm going to subtract my initial value which is 141,784 and then once I find that in my calculator I'm going to divide that by my initial value which is 141,784 then I'm going to multiply that by 100. So when I do this in my calculator, I'm getting negative 40,594. And that is okay that it's a negative number. A negative number means it just went down. Now, when I divide that 40,594 divided by my initial value, I'm then going to multiply it by 100 and I'm getting negative 28.6%. Okay, and so it is okay if my percent change is negative. If we get a negative percent change, that just means that the values went down. And that is in fact exactly what happened. So that's a good little self check. It's also okay if we get a percent change that is greater than 100. But if I had a percent change that's greater than 100 and it was positive, that means things would have doubled or more than doubled. And if things were greater than 100 and it was negative, it would have gone down by more than half. So you can use those as some little estimation guide rules to help you figure out if you've done this in the right way.